Hi everyone, it's Jerry. I have an instructive game to share with you from 1959. This is one of the games from Fisher's famous book, My 60 Memorable Games. He has the white pieces, and he's playing against international master Hector Rossetto. Mr. Rossetto would go on to become a grandmaster not very long after this game, 1960. And about this game... I know I'll frequently begin a video saying I have an instructive game to share with you. This one I feel, though, is one that shines much brighter than most. Before I hit the record button for a video where I'm presenting a game like this, I load the game on my computer. I make several passes uh, through the game using an engine, testing out different lines, and I try to decide what to share and what not to share. This time around for me, though, it was slightly different. The last pass I made with this game was done on one of my physical boards. I did this without using an engine, and I did this in silence. And I'm glad I approached it in this way, because when I made that final pass, I ended up noticing something. All of a sudden, there was a pattern that appeared to me about Fisher's play. And it's this pattern by Fisher that I feel plays a significant role in the final position of this game, one where black ends up in Zugzwang, a position where regardless of what black's move is, there will be a significant downside, and this is frequently seen in the form of material loss. I wonder if you can pick up on what this pattern is as I play through the game. One final note, I really do feel that this game here has a real chance to impact your game. Uh, I really do feel it has a chance to take a player who may be a bit on the impulsive side and help them to become more disciplined. Okay, on board we have an open Sicilian. C4 indicates the Meroxi bind, grip now over D5. And from here, bishop d3. Computer's a fan of this move first, negating any lines related to a pin with bishop to b4. All right, though. Knight c6 here. Bishop e3. Knight takes on d4. Yeah, this move here reminds me of another note about this game. Um, black never really maintains a piece on white side of the board for more than a half move. <laughs> so we just had a capture on d4, and of course we're getting the recapture. Okay, there goes the black piece in white's house. This happens a handful more times. Black never establishes a piece on white side of the board. Okay, we continue, bishop c5. This wasn't the, uh, the main pattern that stuck out to me about the game, though. We continue, bishop c2. White's in a position to recapture on d4. d6. In this position, white castles. Um, the idea to take on c5 is never really a good idea now that this pawn is on d6. This would simply be inviting the black pawn to the fourth rank, and this pawn now all of a sudden would control the weakest square in white's camp, d4. We could already start to see variations where a rook eventually pivots there. Okay, so in this game, it is simply castles. Bishop d7, knight a4. He says, you take me. Black does just that. Queen recapture. Rook d8. Now that there isn't a dark square bishop around, this can certainly be sensitive. White now has some pressure on it. Black simply castles. So you can't win a pawn in this position by taking on d6. In the game, it's rook a to c1. If white takes on d6, we're going to get mass exchanges, and this pawn is going to fall in the end. This is what it would look like. This variation here. After you take like this, this guy's up for grabs. Balanced material. Rook on the open file. Not really a line for white to go down. So it is simply rook a to c1. And now in the game, queen a5 is played. Considered best is to knock out the knight and only then play queen a5 to play this unbalanced minor piece position. 
Okay. Then this one, though, it is queen a5 straight away. So this guy is hit twice. But white has a nice move here. Queen b6. No time to take on a4. So we get this queen exchange. And with that, we go straight from middle game to end game. Okay. Bishop c6. This guy's hit twice. Convenient enough to defend this guy. The king is now also ready to contribute. Knight d7. Let me throw this to you as a pop quiz. How would you respond to this last move? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, in the game, best move, knight d5. So for much of this game, it's even. It's even in this position. Um, how do you get it to a point where there's still some chance to win? How do you create some imbalance, in other words? This is an attempt to do just that. We're going to have, coming up, a knight for bishop exchange, as well as uh, a change with the structure. Now, in the game, it's bishop takes knight. What's the story if the pawn captures the knight? How is white recapturing? Well, this guy has a responsibility to control the b5 square. So white would be taking with the e-pawn in the event of pawn takes. Uh, on d5, and white would get the piece back and uh, be the better side here, especially if this capture is allowed and the d pawn is exposed. So black doesn't approach it in that way. He simply captures with the bishop. And now, how to recapture? White's recapturing with the e pawn. Now, initially, you may think, oh, you do that so that the bishop's eyes are opened up. That is a reason, though I think it's a secondary reason. Um, there are some cases here, after the reply e5, the bishop can go to not g5, but rather f5, and be irritating in some cases. But really the main thing, the primary reason behind this capture is to create an imbalance with the structure. Let's now have a look at the queen side. And what's going on here? Well, we now have a case of four versus three. What does this mean? Well, with enough prep work, eventually white will be able to acquire a passed pawn on the queen side. Okay, we see this in action right away. In comes b5, taking away as well uh, the c5 square from the knight. From here, g6, light square, prep work for f5 as well. All right, bishop a4 is the follow-up, and the reply here is, well, let me not uh, share what that is just yet. Let me throw this to you as a pop quiz. How would you react to this last move? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, in the game, it is b6, considered one of the, the best moves. If you were thinking about playing knight b6 in this position, let me give you some tips as to why you shouldn't approach the position in this way. I could see many players play this move thinking, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet this attacking move with a counterattack. What's the issue? Well, the issue is white takes a step back and says, my bishop is better than your knight. My bishop controls your knight. And my bishop doesn't get in the way of any of my pieces or pawns, and your knight does. The b pawn now can't move, cannot play a role in trying to restrict these guys from moving. In particular, you know, black is not anywhere closer to stopping a c5 break. Okay, in the game, it is b6. There's this grip over the c5 square. From here, rook d3, you'll notice with the b6 move, a6 is now unprotected. This move is a step in the direction of targeting that weak point. The reply here is f5. This is where black starts to go a little stray. The best move is a5, anticipating this idea, trying to at least interfere with this idea of putting the rook on a3. In what way does a5 try to interfere with rook a3? Well, you have to do something about b4. White all of a sudden would have this question. 
uh, do I try to maintain control over c5? Or in other words, do I play a3? This would interfere with rook a3 in order to maintain b4 so that I maintain control over the knight c5 move? What other options would white have in reply to a5? If you're taking on a5, earlier I just showed a position where the light square bishop would be uh, preferable to a knight. Here's a situation where the knight would immediately become the best piece in the game. Hitting the rook, hitting the bishop, and this is not a good position for white. Look at that knight. Golden square on c5. A pawn, poison. You'd end up in a pin. What other options would there be after a5? c5, here's a line that is apparently going to turn out to be equal. We enter this rook and pawn endgame. Okay. The game doesn't go in that direction. No a5, instead f5. And now, rook a3, swing the bat completely around. A blink away now from taking the knight and taking on a6. Black apparently has just one chance left to stay in the game. He doesn't find it. He plays the second best move. In the game, the knight goes to b8, securing that a6 pawn. What is considered best? Yet again, what's being suggested here is a5. Now, in order to play a5, you have to say to yourself, okay, I am fine with entering a rook and pawn endgame down a pawn. That's what this continuation turns out to be. After takes, 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 there we are. Computer says there's still a fighting chance for a draw here. Okay, not easy for a human to pull that continuation off. Second best move, as it turns out, is a losing move. White now gets to create this passed pawn. The minor pieces still stay on board. If it's just the rooks, greater chance that you could hold the draw, but this guy is superior to the knight in this endgame. More pawn exchanges is good news for the long-range piece. So, c5, b takes c, b takes c, d takes c, rook takes c. This guy was poisoned all the while. There would be a pin and win of the rook if it was ever captured. From here, king g7, rook b3, rook f7. Now that this guy is on the seventh rank, this one is tied down to defending the knight. So... White can now push the passed pawn. No rook takes pawn because of rook takes knight. Knight d7. Rook c7. It was under fire. Knight f8. And from here, rook b7. Taking the rook is just going to be helping the king. He's not moving forward, but he's moving in the direction he wants to go to. Approaching this pawn. Black needs to track this guy down, but by playing rook b7... Two pigs on the seventh rank here. This is forcing black to capture on c7. White recaptures with the pawn and is now a blink away from promoting with discovered check. Only one way to stop that. Rook c8. And now only one winning move here. I wonder if you can spot it. Feel free to pause the video. Okay, winning move is bishop b3, cutting out. Knight e6. If this knight could get here, this pawn is going to fall. So, now black is in quite the predicament. What do you do to improve your position? These next handful of moves, the remaining moves here by both sides are just pawn moves, and we get to a point where uh, all their advances have been exhausted, and we get to this Zugzwang position. What's the issue? with moving any of the black pieces. Well, if we look at the black rook, can't take the pawn, of course, it's defended. Any move along the 8th rank allows promotion with check. Any knight move, let's say to d7, would allow bishop e6, and there's a problem here. Black's going to have to give up material very soon. And the last note, what do you do with the king? 
any king move would leave some defense of the knight. So for instance, the most logical looking move, moving in this direction, trying to track this guy down, this would now be met with rook b8. What are you doing here? The rook takes pawn. That's the best you could do. And then you're going to lose the knight. It's just a little bonus there to do it with check. Completely winning. So black is now in this giant knot. He cannot move any pieces. He has to move pawns, but they're easily just going to run out of gas. A5 met with A4. H6, H3, G5, G4, chop. One more chop. That right there is the ball game. Black throws in the towel. What do you do? Any pawn move. You're just going to lose material. And we already had a look at all other piece moves. What is the pattern in this game that I feel has played a significant role that played a significant role in this final position. Let's have a look at this bishop. It's a third rank bishop. Look at the rook. It's a seventh rank rook. Look at the pawn, a seventh rank pawn. Look at the black pieces, ranks one and two. Black is on his back foot. There were nine cases in this game of a capture, recapture sequence. And you know what? In each of those cases, Fisher was never the one to initiate the capture. He was always the one to recapture. He was the king of the recapture in this game. When you're recapturing, you are, after the pieces have been traded, you are improving your piece very often. You're improving by a couple ranks. If I take just a a quick skim through this game right there. The knight has improved a rank on the recapture. Right here, improved slightly with the bishop. When the queen recaptures, she's improving three ranks. He does this time and time again. The knight is improving there on the recapture. It continues nine cases of this in the game. Once c5 is in, capture, recapture, capture, recapture. And even we, when we get to the seventh rank here, He's not initiating the capture. He's taking this you capture me approach. Capture, recapture, and black in the end is in this Zugzwang position. It's not always going to happen like this, but I think that this is an excellent game that highlights that strategy in the game. It's okay to not uh, initiate the capture. Very often, this can be beneficial. And I think this is highlighted very well with this one game, this idea here. This is a subject I, uh, I covered in the one video uh, on, in my Beginner to Chess Master playlist, video number 28, this stop before you chop uh, approach. Anyhow, I hope covering this video in this particular way was helpful for you. I hope it was more memorable for you. Anyhow, feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback to this video in the comment section below. Hope you enjoyed it, maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care. Bye.